Here are the biggest unanswered questions after The Mandalorian Season 3. Welcome to Nerdist News, I'm Dan Casey, and today we're diving back into The Mandalorian Season 3 finale. While we previously broke the episode down in detail and how it kind of feels like a series finale in many ways, today we're looking to the future with the show's biggest unanswered questions. Although Chapter 24, The Return, wrapped up many of the show's plot lines and answered several burning questions, it raised even more questions over the course of the season. And we're going to break it all down for you in just a moment, but to do so we have to spoil specifically The Mandalorian Season 3 three finale. So if you're not up to date and you're worried about that sort of thing, leave now before it's too late. Let me think about it. You already did. Okay, let's get into it, shall we? The final episode of Season 3 brought an uneven season of The Mandalorian to a close, and it turned countless theories on their heads in the process with some surprisingly straightforward answers. But there were some questions that still went unanswered even after Bo-Katan, Din Djarin, and Din Grogu led the Mandalorian people to victory against Moff Gideon. So let's start with the biggest mystery of the season, or so we thought. Was there really a second spy? The penultimate episode was titled The Spies, as in spies plural, which had many of us feverishly speculating about who this second secret turncoat might be. Now the first spy is Elia Kane, but was there actually a second spy? I'm the spy. Well, if there is, they're certainly playing the long con because it wasn't the armorer as we thought it might be. And it definitely wasn't Axe Woves as many others theorized. Although for a minute there, Axe was acting pretty sus on that ship. It turns out though, he was just doing that so he could help Moff Gideon with his Gus Fring cosplay. Now another spy could still be out there, but for now, we're just left to wonder. I'm the spy. But speaking of Moff Gideon, our biggest question about the Mando's most menacing villain is, did he really die? I mean, we saw him engulfed in a fiery explosion and presumably falling to his death. But as we mentioned in our finale breakdown, this is a franchise famous for having bad dudes in black costumes survive horrible burns, falling into open pits, and somehow returning. Somehow Palpatine returned. So if we didn't see a body, he could always come back later on, maybe in like the post credit scene of that Dave Filoni movie. As for how Moff Gideon could return, that brings us to our next question. Are there other Moff Gideon clones still out there? The most shocking revelation of the entire episode is that Moff Gideon's back to tanks full of bodies aren't proto-Snokes, but clones of himself. I know, I know, I'm shocked that this man lied to a bunch of his colleagues, but here we are. The creation of clones is your obsession, not mine. Moff Gideon's bases on Navarro and Mandalore have both been destroyed along with the clones they contained. But did the Imperial Remnant's most arrogant Moff have another repository of bodies full of genetically engineered giddy chlorians? Could we see one of these force sensitive Gideons appear somewhere down the line? I mean, it's certainly an option, but I gotta be honest, for now I think the runway's being cleared for Grand Admiral Thrawn. But that in turn does raise a question in and of itself. What does Moff Gideon's cloning project mean for Project Necromancer and Supreme Leader Snoke? We know that Brendel Hux was hard at work on Project Necromancer, which seems to be Palpatine's plan to give the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise a happy ending. It's not a story the Jedi would tell you. Another question we have around this is how much of Dr. Pershing's mind and research actually remain? The lead scientist on Gideon's Six Sith Science Project centered on trying to combine multiple strands of DNA that created replicas that incorporated the best genetic attributes of both donors. Gideon had Elia Kane give Pershing the R.P. McMurphy special. She did that to prevent his cloning work from falling into the New Republic's hands, but more importantly to keep it away from the rest of the Imperial Shadow Council. Given Gideon's arrogance and repeated attempts to undercut Thrawn's impending return, it seems like he sees himself as the heir to the Empire and doesn't want anybody else to threaten that, especially not a Mecha Palpatine. The worst kind of Palpatine. But clearly some elements of Pershing's work do survive to help create Supreme Leader Snoke. The question is though, how does this happen and what strains of DNA were combined to make that wretched beef puppet? Seriously, looks like someone put Dobby in a microwave. Now obviously Palpatine is a part of that equation, but is someone like Grogu's blood still in the mix? Or did they take other force sensitive blood from another dark side disciple like Kylo Ren, or maybe someone else at Luke's ill-fated Jedi Academy? Now secret cloning projects aside, we're also left to wonder how will the Empire's defeat on Mandalore affect the Imperial Shadow Council? While the Imperial Remnant are portraying themselves as just disorganized warlords, they did lose a considerable detachment of troops, Praetorian guards, ships, and mouse droids in this battle on Mandalore. It was a disaster. 
Now, of course, some of those losses could be due to simple OSHA violations because apparently it would literally kill them to install a railing basically anywhere in their facilities. <laughs> Even so, losses like that certainly have to take a toll on the Imperial Remnant, especially when they're already spread so thin relative to the past. I'm sure we'll see exactly how it affects them, though, come this August with Ahsoka. On the flip side of the coin from the Shadow Council, we have to wonder, does the New Republic have, like, any follow-up questions about Moff Gideon's escape? I haven't heard of it. They seem to be pretty chill about the fact that Gideon escaped their custody and didn't seem to mind accepting that Mandos might be responsible for it. Are you saying that Moff Gideon was taken by Mandalorians? When Din Djarin and Grogu head to a Delphi base to meet with Carson Teva, it's all just pretty good natured. We really appreciate what you did. You made our jobs a lot easier. They blow past the fact that they just fought a massive battle against one of the most wanted men in the galaxy far, far away. Instead, they negotiate a bounty hunting stipend. Let me think about it. You already did. But maybe that's the point. The lack of oversight and space fascists slipping through the cracks are what happens when you have this feckless, ineffectual government trying its media mist to govern a gigantic galaxy far, far away. I haven't heard of it. But with that said, let's take things back a bit further. This season also finally answered a major question. How Grogu survived the events of Order 66. It was apparently thanks to the protection of the Jedi Master, Keller and Beck, played by the one and only Ahmed Best. When we last saw this dynamic duo, they managed to escape Coruscant thanks to a ship from Naboo. But the question then becomes, what happened to Grogu after he escaped with Keller and Beck? Did he continue his Jedi training at all? Who helped him along the way? And how old was he when he first got to the Jedi Academy in the first place? I'm just confused about the timeline here. Also, will Grogu ever wind up getting that yellow lightsaber we saw teased in a season two poster? And if so, is that the same yellow lightsaber we see Rey with years later in The Rise of Skywalker? And look, the questions go on and on. This is all to say nothing of Grogu's actual origins and if he's like Yoda's secret clone or love child or all of the above. <laughs> Long story short, we got some Mando lore, but now we need some Grogu lore. But speaking of the Mando lore we did get and Grogu's adopted people, what's going to happen to the Mandalorians under Bo-Katan's leadership? The title of last week's episode, The Return, signaled, among other things, a return to their people's cultural roots. Just as the survivors started farming ancient strains of Mandalorian crops and plant life, the Darksaber's been destroyed, so they must return to their ways of non-sword-based government. So will this unification actually last under Bo's leadership, or will they return to their fractious infighting? And what happens to them between the events of this show and when we see a couple of Mandalorian Fang fighters in the Battle of Exegol and the Rise of Skywalker? As for the Mythosaur, it is provably alive and well beneath the living waters of Mandalore. Both Bo-Katan and Grogu know of its existence, but will it reveal itself to anybody else? Is it just waiting for Grogu to return and claim his rightful role as the Mandalore so he can ride that mammoth monster into battle? I sure hope so. And while we're on the topic of giant creatures, one last question. What happened to those little raptor babies that were going to eat Paz Vizsla's son Ragnar earlier in the season? Did they ever make it to Mandalore? I mean, I sure hope so, because Grogu and company are going to need all the help they can get to take down Thrawn. Anyway, folks, there you have it. Those are the biggest unanswered questions after the Mandalorian Season 3 finale. And if you want to go even deeper into Mandalore, we have plenty of other deep dives for you over on Nerdist.com. But in the meantime, folks, tell us, what did you think of the finale? What unanswered questions do you have after this season? Let us know in the comments below, and for the latest and greatest in the world of pop culture, make sure you stay tuned to Nerdist.com.